Section 16.2 of Sergey Lang's Basic Mathematics covers to some techniques using summations to calculate the volumes of solids. And we're, I'm going to show you how to do the cone. I'm going to show you a technique to, to calculate the volume of a cone. The homework problems will let you work out how to do it for a sphere, as well as for any curve revolved around the x-axis. So a cone is defined as follows. So we have, in this case, we're going to have a distance from the x-axis that's the height of the cone. And then we're going to revolve the cone around a circle at the base. I'll just kind of try my best to draw an ellipse because you're kind of looking at it a, kind of at an angle. And then the line from here to here. And we're going to take the height is equal to the radius is equal to 1. And so this curve here is x equals y. And we're going to revolve that curve x equals y around the x-axis. Okay. We're going to show that the volume of the cone is actually pi over 3. Noting that the volume of a cylinder is, this is r, this is h, the volume of a cylinder is pi r squared h. What we're going to do now is take this and cut this up into n small pieces. Okay? So each of these n small pieces we're going to turn into a disk. Okay? Like this. And then we're going to say that the total volume of the cone is equal to the sum of all these disks, or at least approximated by the volume of these disks. So we're going to take the sum from k is equal to 0 to n. And the width of each of these disks is, what well, we're going to take the here, pi r squared h, which is equal to the sum of k equals 0 to n of pi. What's the r? The r at, so we're going to go from 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, all the way up to n. And so the height, or the radius, is just the distance. So this is just k over n. And we're squaring that. And then now we're going to take the height of that slice, which is just 1 over n. And so we can separate out from there some things that aren't k. So we have pi, which is a coefficient of each of the terms. We have 1 over n cubed. We got n squared from this term and n from this one. And then now we have the sum of k equals 0 to n of k squared. Okay. Now, because the first term k equals 0 is just 0, we can just leave that out. So we have pi pi times 1 over n cubed times the sum of k equals 1 to n of k squared. Okay, so the first term is just 0. Okay. Now we've already worked out in the last section what this sum is. This sum is um, it's going to be pi over n cubed times uh, 1 sixth n times n plus 1 times 2n plus 1. This comes from exercise 2 of section 1, so if you want to prove that, you can go back to that section and do it for yourself. Now, we can rewrite this. Let's distribute this, these n cubes. So this one of these n's will cancel this guy. One of these n's will divide over here, and one of these n's will divide over there. And so we'll get rid of all those n cubed. So we have pi over 6 times n plus 1 over n times 2n plus 1 over n. And so we can distribute the terms. Let's have 1 plus 1 over n, and then 2 plus 1 over n. Okay. Now as n tends towards infinity, and this is where the, fit the calculus arguments comes from, you're going to note that these terms are going to go to 0. So what we're left with is pi over 6 times 1 plus 0 times 2 plus 0. So that's just pi over 6 times 2, so pi over 3. And that's the solution that we anticipated to get. Okay. So again, let's walk through the, the logic one more time just in case you missed it. We're going to slice up this cone into uh, disks or cylinders. The volume of cylinders is pi r squared h. So we're going to add up n of these cylinders. Each the r squared, the r is the distance from the origin because we have the line x equals y. So that's the radius here. So that's k over n squared. And then the width, or the height of the disk of the cylinder is 1 over n. We can pull the pi and the n, n cubed out. So we get the sum from k equals 0 to the n of k squared, which is the same as the sum from k equals 1 to n of k squared, because the first term k equals 0 is just 0. Okay. Then we use the solution from uh, exercise 2 to show that it's pi over 6, n plus 1 over n, 2n plus 1 over n moving that n cubed term around, which gives us this when n approaches infinity. 
and so we get power over 3. Okay. Suppose that we wanted to find the volume of an arbitrary cone that has an arbitrary r, r and h. So we have this cone going out here, and so it has a radius, it has a height, and the radius may not be equal to 1, and the height may not be equal to 1. Okay? And definitely the radius and the height may not be equal. Okay? There is a couple techniques to do this. Um, we're going to find that the volume is going to be 1 third pi r squared h. Okay? The technique that you can use to do this is to do what we just did all over again, which is a great exercise that's left for you as exercise 1 in the back. I'm going to show you a different way to think about this. This is using mixed dilations. Okay, So if we use uh, C of R H, this describes the cone radius R height H, right? Um, it should be intuitively clear that this cone is going to be the same as the cone with 1, 1 transformed through some scaling transformation A, B, C. Okay, so we're going to take this cone and transform it through this, and that should give us the cone of R and H if the scaling factors along the x-axis is H and along the y and the z-axis is R. Okay, so let's remind ourselves what this does. So if we have the dilation F, A, B, C, and we apply that to some point X, comma, Y, comma, Z, then we will get the point AX, by cz. So it takes each point and it stretches it out by that much. Okay. So the cone, if we had this cone, let's say, this is the 1, 1 cone, we would stretch the x-axis out by h, and we'd have to stretch the y and the z-axis out by r. So the transformation we're looking for is f of h comma r comma r. Okay. What would be the volume of this? Let's use a little bit more rigorous thinking here. Well, if we had a rectangle, okay, and we, this, let's say that this had volume of one, right? And we transform this rectangle through this transformation. Well, what do we expect to happen? The width is going to increase by this A term, the height by this B term, and this depth by the C term. And so we expect the volume to transform into uh, A, times b times c, okay? So for each little unit of volume that makes up the cone, we expect the volume to, when it's transformed through this thing, so the volume of the cylinder should also transform by those factors. And so we're going to take the volume of the cone, 1, 1, and then we're going to times that by the height, and we're going to times that by the radius squared, okay? And we've already calculated the volume of the simple cone, which is just pi over 3. So we have power over 3, r h squared, r, h r squared, or r squared h, which is the result we're looking for. If you're wondering why this dilation is exactly the dilation we're looking for, I kind of just fudged that, but let's kind of talk more precisely, okay? So the cone r comma h is defined as all the points x comma y comma z, such that 0 is less than or equal to x, is less than or equal to h, and y squared plus z squared is less than or equal to r over h x squared. Okay, You should recognize this as the disk. This is the formula for a disk. So at each point x, the disk can be no bigger than r over h x squared. Okay, So let me just try to draw out what that means. So we have a point over here x. Okay, and the ultimate disk goes out to h, and it has a limit r, but there's a line that connects these two like that, and so at this point, this is r over h times x, okay? And so that's the radius at that slice of a circle or disk that the x and y coordinates must be within. We can rewrite a little bit, so we can move this r term underneath by dividing everything by r squared. So we get y squared, y over r, squared plus z over r squared is less than x over h squared, okay? That should look very familiar now, okay? 
And in fact, if we had coordinates y prime is equal to y over r, z prime is equal to z over r, and x prime is equal to x over h, right? Then we see that this becomes x prime squared plus z prime squared is less than or equal to, uh, I'm sorry, x prime squared. This is y prime squared, I'm sorry. Okay, now what, is, what would be the volume of this? Well, in the y prime, z prime, and x prime coordinates, this would be a simple cone. Also, zero would be less than or equal to x prime as less than or equal to one, okay? Because we can rewrite this equation up at the top as zero is less than or equal to x over h is less than or equal to one. So what we're really doing is we're transforming, if you go back to the section on analytical geometry, we're transforming the coordinate system to use these new prime coordinates that are scaled by the factor r and by the factor h. Okay, And thus, it's pretty plainly clear now that we, we can apply the transformation. So f applied to x, y, z should give you um, uh, x prime, y prime, and z prime. And so this scaling, of course, is uh, h, r, and r. All right? And that's all that we need to do to prove that the cone described by these, um, the cone described by these coordinates is the same as the unit cone stretched along by the h by the x direction and then r by the y and z directions. The exercises here, they're not as difficult as you might think. Um, it does, one of the things that happens in math is you approach a problem thinking that it's difficult because you've never solved it before. And it's not like any problem that you've solved before. And so you might put up this mental block that says, I can't solve this because it's hard. The truth is, is you're more than well prepared to solve these problems. Um, and hopefully you might have a mind blowing experience when you get the answer. You're like, not really sure it's the answer, but you check your work and then you're like, sure that this must be the answer. And indeed it turns out that that is the actual answer. Okay. So exercise one is to calculate the volume of a cone by approximating an arbitrary cone with cylinder. So using the same technique that I showed you at the beginning, slice it up to n little slices, calculate the uh, volume of each little slice, and then do a summation from zero to n, and then which you're going to convert to a, a summation from one to n. Okay. The rotate the curve is number problem number two is rotating the curve y equals three x about the x axis. Okay, what is the volume obtained when zero is less than x is less than two, zero is less than x is less than five, and zero is less than, less than x is less than c with an arbitrary positive number c. And so number two is, is allowing you to solve for the general case of what a cone is by showing you that these numbers that ended up in the solution were assumed at the beginning. And so if you can just track where these numbers came from by using variables, right? You can save yourself a lot of time in the future. So typically uh, we solve equations. You might have been used to solving equations for numbers with numbers in them. I want you to get used to solving equations with variables in them, okay? So that you can solve the general case and you can you can take the general case and turn it back into the specific case with the numbers, okay? Number three, rotate the curve y equals the root of x about the x-axis. What is the volume of the solid attain when zero is less than x is less than h, and h has the value h equals one, h equals two, h equals three, and an arbitrary h. This one is the same technique. Just take the sum of each of the disks, calculate the height of the disk, um, the radius of the disk, which is the height of the coordinates y equals the square root of x. Pretty straightforward. Number four is rotate the curve y equals the square root of r squared minus x squared about the x-axis. What is the volume of the solid attain when blah, blah, blah? This is actually, um, if look at problem five, what is the solid obtained? So I'm going to just kind of give you a little hint here. So y is equal to the square root of r squared minus x squared. What happens if we square both sides? We get y squared is equal to r squared minus x squared. Okay. You, and I'm not going to do the last step here, but what if you put the x squared on the other side? What do you get? And what equation does that represent? Okay. So if you're not familiar with what equation that represents, I encourage you to take a piece of graph paper and map out all x and y's that can solve for r. Okay, it'll take you a while to list all of them because there's an infinite number, but I want you to you know, take a couple. Like for instance, take zero for x. What does y have to be? Take zero for y. What does x have to be? Don't forget it can be positive or negative, right? And then maybe take, um, try taking the value for r of x of r over root of two and see what you get for y, okay? 
Number six, find the area between the curve y equals x squared and the x-axis from the origin to the following values of x. So now you're calculating the volume of a par parabola rotated around the x-axis. Again, using the same techniques. Seven, find the area between the curve y equals x cubed, doing the same thing. Number eight, let S be the region and the plane consisting of all points x, y, such that zero is less than x is less than one, and zero is less than y is less than x squared. Let T be the region and the plane consisting of all points x, y, such that zero is less than x is less than one, and zero is less than y and three x squared. Express T as the image of S under a mixed dilation, okay? What is the area of T? Okay, so in problem number eight, he doesn't want you to solve for t. He doesn't want you to figure out what t is supposed to be. He says take and calculate for s and then figure out what that dilation of t, what dilation gives you t from s and then calculate the volume based on that. And number nine, let c be a number greater than zero. What is the area of the region lining between the curve y equals cx squared and the x-axis from the origin of the following values of x? x equals one, x equals two, x equals three. So uh, this is just using the results you used earlier. You can either try to solve it again from scratch, or you can use the results you used earlier, plug in the formulas, and get the equation, get the solutions out of it. Guys, I hope you enjoyed this section. This is actually a fun section. I, I don't want to do these problems for you. I want to allow you the experience of solving these for yourself. Um, this is one of those chapters, I think, where you start to really realize what you've stumbled into as you've developed your math abilities. And um, it, it can be tempting to not memorize the volumes of these solids. Um, what's the right way to put this? I encourage you to memorize them anyway, just in case you're like on a test and somebody says, what's the volume of the cone? So you don't have to take five or 10 minutes to derive it from yourself. But knowing how to drive these things, this is something you can do when you're walking to and from your classes or whatever you're walking to. Just think about it in your head and remind yourself how you do these solids and try to think of new problems that you can solve on your own. Guys, take care. I'll catch you in the next section. Bye-bye. This video was part of my series on Basic Mathematics by Sergey Lang. Be sure to subscribe and ring the bell, like and share this video. You can find me on Discord and support me on Patreon. Thanks a million.